Shannon? Yes, Alicia. When you get uh, settled, can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Misty, do you mind just on that computer back there, just hitting the OK button for me? Thank you. All right, Alicia. Please. Okay, so um, I recently had a situation where I used the tax record name. I know we were going back, sorry. Um, That's okay. Um, and when I got it back, it said like his name was, had his name, right? And then the wife had just like her and her, um, I don't know if it's her maiden name or if it's like, it must be her maiden name, but it didn't have his last name. And sometimes you see that where, you know, um, you know, uh, couples don't go by the same name. And um, it was in the tax record and the lady did not have all the documents filled out to where, you know, what what we would go by. So she uh, she said, well, she prefers to go by his last name. So he she's like, his name's like Greg Field, Field. And she was like Natalie Ralph's. And she's like, she's Natalie Ralph's Field. I'm like, yeah, but that's not on the tax record. That's how it was populated in in the MLS. So I don't, yep. do yep. I need to add, do That's I good. need for closing, do I need to um, kind of correct that or what do you think? Okay, so that's a great question. So when it comes to um, a maiden name situation, especially where, you know, they, they buy the property before they're married and then after they have bought the property, they get married and the deed is never changed, right? So the listing agreement would reflect exactly what's on the deed. And my suggestion is to have the seller sign with their maiden name and their current name, okay? So I, if I had bought the property with my husband, it would be Nathan Lauderstein and Shannon Mulroney, right? And so I would sign as Shannon Mulroney Lauderstein because my legal name now is Shannon Lauderstein. Um, and that way we're covering all the bases on this agreement. So it's, the challenge comes in when the names are so backwards that you can't identify that it's the same person or it could be a different person. Um, so that, that's how I suggest it when there's a maiden name involved. Okay. And would you suggest, um, providing a marriage certificate with so that. they don't have to provide us the marriage certificate the if the name, right if the name has changed completely right um so that it's not recognizable um then i would say give us something that shows their name has changed so that we know that we're entering into the agreement with the right person but the title company is going to want a copy of the marriage certificate and some proof that they are one in the same person, right? And so, um, so we don't need to do any correction to the contract or anything like that. Correct. Okay. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you. I, in, in all my 10 minute spiel, I um, should have brought that up as well. So thank you very much for that question. All right, so we are on legal description. Uh, lot block subdivision is how most of our legal descriptions are going to be uh, played out for us. In our tax records, there is a section that in most cases will break this down for you for the lot block section or phase where the property is located. Um, and it will have a section for the subdivision or condo association. There's also in the legal description, you can uh, decipher the code, which I will be showing you, to pull out the lot and the block and the phase. It's in the legal description um, if it's not set up for you in the top section of the tax record. Now, remember, the tax records in Bright are being imported from the county records from somewhere else. And so it just depends on where it's being imported from, whether all the data comes in. But the, the actual true legal description is, is going to have the information for you. The county or municipality that it's in, um, so if it's in the city of Falls Church, 
right? Versus um, Fairfax County, if it's in Falls Church. Um, the deed book, um, that LIBOR number is sometimes how it's reflected um, for the page number. Meets and bounds, you're not gonna deal with too much up in the Northern Virginia area. Occasionally there's gonna be some rural um, properties that our Fredericksburg agents will come across that maybe it's a meets and bounds type description. Usually it's lot block and subdivision. MLS description, this is easy, fill in what you know. Basement entrance type, this confuses people a lot. Um, basement entrance type is how do you get to the basement? So is there a connecting stair from the inside? Um, usually that's the case in the properties that we sell. It's not like a cellar that you access from outside of the property. The basement type, is it walk up, walk out, um, fully finished? Go ahead and just make notes on there for what you know and your seller can tell you this is gonna help you for later. All right, notices. This is just like on the buyer agreement. We need the seller's contact information. I promise you I'm not contacting your sellers unless I absolutely have to. Um, and very rarely would there be a reason. Broker firm information is on your marketing cheat sheet. And the term of our agreement, okay. So this is one that actually can be longer than your buyer agreement in a lot of cases because you want to have these sellers commit to you now, even if they don't wanna sell until the spring. You want them to get, commit to you now. So this in a lot of cases could be nine months. It could be a year. It doesn't have to be 30 days, 60 days. Um, if you meet with someone now who says they don't wanna sell until the spring, that's okay. Get them to commit to you now. If the agreement expires while you are under contract, it automatically extends to the settlement date. So you do not need to send me a listing amendment. The only time that you would send me a listing amendment while it's under contract is if you have a feeling that that buyer is going to fall apart and the home is gonna to need to go back on the market, then you would send me a listing amendment to be uh, proactive, that listing extended before the buyer falls apart. But if everything looks good, then it automatically extends to closing and there's no need to have that listing amendment um, signed for the extension. Listing price. Okay, so there are a couple of key elements to a contract, all right? You have to have an expiration date. If you don't fill in an expiration date on the buyer agreement or this listing agreement, it defaults to 90 days. So I really would prefer that everybody has a meeting of the minds and that there's a date put in there. The second key element to a contract is the price. TBD, is not acceptable here. TBD negates the validity of this agreement. So why put TBD, right? I understand that from the practical side, you're going on an appointment today. Your seller doesn't wanna go on the market till March. I don't have any idea what the price is gonna be in March. Why can't I put TBD? If you put TBD, you would have to do a listing amendment anyway to pick a price when you go on the market in March. So you're not saving yourself any paperwork because you're gonna pick a price now and then you're just gonna do a listing amendment to change the price before you go on the market in the spring, okay? So what my suggestion is here is that you price it, A, as if it was going on the market now, Okay, that's my first suggestion. Or B, what your seller's target price is for the spring. It's better to price it as if it was going on the market now because you are having the conversation with the client about how pricing works, right? For the condition of the home, 
This is how we would price it. This is how we review comps. This is how much more you could get now if you did X, Y, Z work to it. If it was as is condition, this is what we would do, right? So the only known is today and the past. You don't know the future. So that is my suggestion is to price it if it was going on the market today. And then let your client know during your listing appointment how you handle properties that are going on the market in the future, right? So in part of my listing appointments, I talked to every client. It didn't matter if they were going on the market in two weeks or they were going on the market in two years. It didn't matter. I watch the market and I keep them updated on pricing of what's happening. I set them up on an MLS automatic search. So they're getting updates on what's happening in their neighborhoods so they can keep an eye on what's happening. And I tell them that my brochures that I print never have the price because up until the day we go on the market, we are watching the price. And if we can increase the price, we're going to increase the price. And if we have to adjust the price down a little bit so that we can be competitive, that's what we're gonna do. And I always give them the option that we're gonna increase the price because that makes them feel good, right? Even though I know that what price I gave them is likely the price we're going on the market for, right? Because I've done my homework. But I give them the option. I, I make them feel like they have some control over the situation. You'll run into a seller or two that's like, well, how do I know I'm not really logged in at that price? So in the additional terms section at the end, you know how I really don't like you to put anything there? This is one of the times that I'll allow you to put something. And you can, you can just put in writing there that final list price to be confirmed via amendment 48 hours prior to list, right? Um, so that doesn't... It, that doesn't hurt anything, right? You're just putting in writing for them because you need them to have a price, okay? Everybody good with that? Yes. Now that yes. paragraph actually says, oh, guys know, if the seller instructs broker to offer the property for sale at selling price of blank, Shannon? We need to just enforce it, okay? Shannon, quick question. Media, you have a question? So you said that yes. the final list price to be confirmed two days before it goes live, is, is that like an addendum or should we put it right on this contract? As a no, note? there's a section right at the end for other terms and you okay. can just put it right there. Okay. Okay, and I'll show you guys where that is when we get to the end. Okay, thanks. All right, All right. conveyances. The conveyance section is um, important to talk to your sellers about during your listing appointment or when you're reviewing this so that there is no confusion at the final walkthrough of what's supposed to still be attached to the wall and what is supposed to be off the walls and what's supposed to still be in the property and what's supposed to be not. Gailey. I just had that happen yesterday that I walked through the um, TV mounts were all taken off. Oh, yes. And I called the listing agent and I said, hey, she took all the TV mounts and she ran across the side and it was just like, so we yeah. had to delay closing like a half an hour to get a credit to repair mm -hmm. the walls. And my clients didn't care about the TV mounts, but. Right, but the holes in the walls they cared about. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did they know, and he's like, I told them. Right. They want to exactly. to yeah. So Gailey had a situation yesterday that's exactly what we're going to talk about um, having to do with TV mounts. And um, one of the suggestions that I make, even though this the agent on the other side confirmed that they had the conversation with the sellers, um, I, as a listing agent, always go and do a quick walkthrough before the buyers go and do a quick walkthrough. Okay, I know many of you have heard me say that because I wanna know what the buyers are gonna see before I get a call from the buyer's agent with whatever they saw, right? I want to know how the property looks. I wanna know if my clients didn't listen to me. I wanna know if I've gotta do a quick whatever, right? Or I wanna know if 
I should pick up the phone and call the buyer's agent and say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. When you guys get here, you're going to see that there are, hole, there are holes left. I'm not sure what happened yet. I just saw it, but I just wanted you to know I'm working on it and I'll get back to you because the reception that the buyers have when they walk into the house and see the holes in the wall is going to be much nicer because they knew about it than showing up and being like, goodness gracious, right? Like, come on, could they have just done what they were supposed to? Yes. Right so, on. It, I, I just thought of it when you mentioned holes in the wall. So we went to see this house yesterday. They were about to fall. Mm -hmm. But it's our third time seeing that house. Mm -hmm. And they're moving out like now. Mm -hmm. And there was a TV mounted. Mm -hmm. And now they it's gone. Mm -hmm. And there's a hole in the wall. Mm -hmm. But like we haven't offered on it yet. So does it mm -hmm. not matter? Right. And we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about the condition more on Monday. Um, as far as what the condition needs to be when you get to closing. So just, so my question when that happened and I had to call through, I'm like, so um, what happens? Can we, can we stop the whole process right no. there as buyer? Like, so can the buyer say, I'm not proceeding to close? No. So the question, the question is, if there's an issue at walkthrough, can the buyer not close? And the answer is no. The buyer's remedy is to close and sue the seller. And we're going to talk about that a lot more next week when we get into the contract documents. Shannon? But usually we work, we work it out. Yes, Mary. Uh, so how many days uh, the buyers has after settlement to address any, like, anything wrong with the, with the, with the house? After the walkthrough, sometimes our eyes oh. don't, don't pick something and then the buyers Second day, third day, they said, Mary, this is, we didn't see it. And they sent a picture or something. Well, so technically none, um, unless they're going to take it to court. And I don't know what the statute of limitations is on that. Um, that might be a David Robertson question. It's probably something between one and three years, just based on my little knowledge of uh, law in Virginia. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about some remedies next week when we get to the contract. So what, what we're doing right here with conveyances is talking to the sellers about what has to be left in the property and what is um, optional to be left in the property. So this has pre-printed language that's, um, that mimics the contract and says that the property includes the following personal property and fixtures, okay? So there's a lot of this that's considered a fixture that will automatically convey if it's there already, okay? So if existing, the built-in heating and central air conditioning equipment, the plumbing and light fixtures, sump pump, attic and exhaust fans, storm windows, storm doors, and screens, installed wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, window shades and blinds, window treatment hardware, smoke and heat detectors, TV antennas, exterior trees and shrubs. Unless otherwise agreed to in writing, all surface or wall mounted electronic component devices do not convey. However, the wall mounts and brackets and hardwares convey. All right, so let's talk about this for a minute. Basically, what it's talking about here when it comes to the TV mounts and the components and window treatments and those types of things is if the piece is physically attached to the wall, it stays. If the piece is removable, right, then it goes. So window blinds and shades automatically convey. Why? Because it's a one piece unit that is attached to the wall, right? You don't pop the blinds off of the brackets to take them on and off, right? The brackets are attached to the blinds and they go on the inside of the window, right? Window treatment hardware, all right? So this is saying that your curtain rods, the rods themselves, if they 
sit on top of a bracket, the rod can go, but the bracket conveys because the bracket is what's attached to the wall. Now, if it's a one piece unit, right, where it's all together, and if you take the rod, you have to take the bracket, then the rod and the bracket stay. The curtains themselves are considered window treatments, right? That's the definition of window treatments is curtains. The curtains are optional. They are personal property because they can come off of the rods. So that's down on the bottom where you would mark yes or no to window treatments, okay? The same thing goes for the TV mounts and the brackets. The actual components, right? The, the device that runs the equipment is not physically mounted to the wall, but there is something that it sits on. Right, what it sits on or is attached to stays because if you remove that, then there's a hole in the wall. Now, can you negotiate that they take the brackets and fix the wall? Absolutely. But this is all what you talk to your clients about because if they've got every TV mounted in the house, you talk to them and let them know, hey, this is what's supposed to automatically convey. So you don't get to take your mounts with you automatically. Let's talk about it. So then in your listing, you put that the TV mounts don't convey and walls will be patched and painted, right? Because you're not leaving holes. The next section is where you mark the other optional items and whether they're in the property and whether or not they convey. There are some sellers that want to take their washer and dryer. They just bought a fancy washer and dryer. I think it's a big fat headache to take a washer and dryer. I say you just buy a new one. Um, you're marking how many ceiling fans there are, right, in the home, if they convey, if there's a garage door opener, uh, how many remotes there are. Any of these things, right? If there is only one, you don't mark one. It's only if there's multiple that you mark how many there are. A cooktop, just to clarify, a cooktop is the, the piece that sits inside the countertop and then you would have a separate wall oven. A stove or range is the one piece unit that slides in that has the, um, where you cook on top and the oven in one piece. You would not have both a stove or range and a wall oven. Um, in most cases, you wouldn't have the stove or range and a cooktop. You're, you're gonna have cooktop and wall oven or the stove or range. Yes. Just a comment. I went to look at an open house and um, it was they were asking, it was in North Arlington, right? So they were asking, $1.250 million for this home, which was not really very remodeled or anything. And they had taken the washer and dryer. There was no mm -hmm. washer and dryer. Mm -hmm. I thought I was, I was, I, I said something to the agent. I said, that's a lot of money to ask for a house and not have a washer and dryer. He said, well, uh, the they just bought a new one and, and they wanted to take it with them. And I told them, mm -hmm. Do whatever they want and i thought well maybe they could have replaced it with a lesser expensive yeah. model just so that i yeah. just thought that was the strangest yeah so it, there was there's a property that um, the sellers had just bought a washer and dryer and they took it with them and so the home shows without the washer and dryer and a suggestion for sellers that want to take something um, is to take it out of the property before you list it and replace it with something um, I've had situations where um, sellers have had light fixtures, chandeliers, things that they want to take with them. That's great. Take it down, replace it with something so that it's not even a question. Um, try to have the, you know, it's the best practice to try to have the home show exactly the way that it's going to convey um, as far as those fixtures are considered. Same thing with wall mounts and TVs, right? Take them down. Just take them down before you go on the market. Patch and paint. So then there's no question. Shannon? Uh, yes, Mary. Uh, one seller uh, uh, said that he, he will replace, but not in the listing. Like the listing agent sent me a message that uh, after inspection that 
the seller will replace those two washer and dryer with the washer and, and dryer in the storage unit in the in the backyard. And I said, we cannot accept this because we are already did our inspection and inspect those two, not, not we inspected the one in the storage. And I inserted and said, I sent an addendum insisting that we will take those two, the dryer and washer we did the inspection on, not the other ones that, that in the storage. And, and they signed, they signed. Because we didn't, we didn't try the one in the storage in the inspection day. Right, and technically the addendum wasn't necessary because those are the, it was unnecessary, right? They were supposed to leave what was there. Okay, excellent, yes. Okay, the next section um, talks yeah, about, yeah. yes. I'm so sorry, um, just a quick question. Um, so I know you mentioned like, for example, the ceiling fan, um, you were saying to like count how many there are. Um, so this is like a listing agreement. So I'm just like um, wondering as far as like, um, like, am I expected to go see the house first and kind of check out all these um, items that convey or not prior to the listing appointment? Um, or when I'm going through this checklist, do I just ask the seller then and there kind of like what items convey or not? So at the listing appointment, you're going to get a tour of the house okay. um, because the seller is going to want to know about pricing and things like that. So you're going to need to see the condition. You're going to need to see the house. And then when sometimes you'll have the listing agreement signed at that first listing appointment, and sometimes you'll send it to them once you get back to your computer and send it to them via DocuSign. It just depends on the situation, uh, but you will always see the house before you list it. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, real quick, the other section right there is for other items that the seller is going to convey. So sometimes you'll see like a, a property that has a lot of land. Maybe they're going to leave their right lawnmower. Uh, maybe they're going to leave the uh, pool table in the basement. Maybe, you know, they're going to leave something else. I don't know, patio furniture or uh, pool furniture. I see that a lot where there's, you know, specific pool furniture that was bought you know, for the pool, you're going to mark that in the other section so that you know what to be advertising. A note, again, a lot of this is really for next week, that it's going to convey no additional value. And so have that conversation with your sellers that those items, that's great, they're going to convey it no additional value and that's going to be marked in the contract. As is items, technically the entire contract is as is when we get to that. So what you're going to do here is have the conversation with your sellers or anything that you know is kind of on this last leg that we need to highlight um, for potential buyers. I, this may sound like super dumb, but so like when I go to MLS, I'm looking at houses and like I would see a listing or it would say in MLS like as is. Mm -hmm. Like, why is that? Yep, that's. No, I said, like, why is that like a, a thing? Like, yeah, that's what, I, uh -huh. that like that's what I'm getting to on the oh, next section. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Okay. So, section C talks about as is marketing and whether or not we, the seller does or does not uh, authorize the broker to offer the property in as is condition. So, again, our contract is as is unless otherwise agreed to in writing. So, why would we have this extra step? Well, we have this extra step because of situations where a seller knows up front they can't do any repairs, period, okay? It doesn't have to be a short sale situation. It doesn't have to be a bankruptcy or a court-ordered sale. It could just be a regular sale where the seller has is tapped out or does, just doesn't have the ability to do any repairs at all. Um, could be a teardown, right? It could, it, could, it could be a number of situations. And so we are having the conversation with our seller up front where they're saying, look, we just have to say up front, we can do nothing. So they can have their home inspection with right to void only, but we're telling them up front, they can't even offer with right to negotiate for repairs because we can do nothing, 
right? So that's more of what that is. Um, there's also in our contingencies and clauses addendum an extra spot for the property to not have to be delivered free and clear of trash and debris and um, to not have to comply with HOA violations and some other things. And that goes into the as is marketing um, to sort of alert potential buyers. And again, it's all whether or not the listing agent is using the as is properly in that case. Um, Gailey and then Christina. So, so this is when, so an agent will put it in and you'll see houses offered as is, like yeah. an agent box or something. Mm -hmm. How does this work with the seller's responsibility to disclose? Like if they know they have a cracked foundation, they're not going to, do they have to disclose that? I guess, I guess I'm not sure what as is. I know they're saying they're not going to do any repairs, but right. is that, are you also saying, we're not talking yeah, so Gailey's question on this as is marketing has to do with sellers requirements for disclosure and there is not a requirement for condition on the seller to disclose anything on condition that it's still on the agent to disclose the material defects. So if they don't tell the agent. Then... Right now the agent, if they could have or should have known or have actual knowledge, then the agent is responsible. So the agent can't say I'm not coming to look at the house and then claim that they had no knowledge, right? Because it's it, it, that's careless of an agent to not go and see a home, right? So that they would full knowledge, right? Um, but remember the seller is in a buyer beware state. So the the issue she would come if a seller blocked a buyer from doing inspections and didn't in turn disclose all of the things that were wrong, right? That would be where the issue is. I don't, I don't understand. So if I have a crack foundation in my house and uh -huh. I market it as is, uh -huh. so I'm, and then I say I'm not going to allow you to do a home inspection at all. That's or, where the issue is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they, the seller doesn't have to provide any information on the condition. However, they have to allow the buyer to do their own due diligence to determine the condition. Or just contract the contract that has no questions. Right. Right. Christina? Just as a quick follow-up okay. to that. Um, so if they did disclose to the agent, where would the agent disclose that? Information? Okay, that's a great question. That's yeah, for, for disclosures. So the best thing to do though, is to have the seller actually disclose it. And so what I suggest doing is just having a regular, you know, Word doc that you type up that says uh, seller's disclosure. And then the seller bullet points what they are disclosing. And you put that with the for the disclosure in bright. And so you take the responsibility off yourself and you take away any confusion that you are doing something against representing your seller because you're having your seller disclose it and then they sign it. Do you have to put that in the verbiage or just upload it as a disclosure? Do you actually have to say that? If there's something if there is something specific like HVAC doesn't work or there's a crack in the foundation, yes, I would Absolutely, advertise it. I mean, you don't have to like send it up with, you know, flares, right? Um, but I, I would because it might deter someone from coming to look at the property. And that's the whole point of having appropriate advertising is you don't wanna waste someone's time, right? You want to be able to make sure that they know ahead of time. And, they, and then there's still gonna be a lot that come anyway and say, well, let me take a look, right? It might not be as bad as, as it sounds. So if the seller uh, is just doing as is and they don't know that it's a cracked foundation, but then a buyer is interested and they have an inspection and they learn that it's, do they then have to add that to their disclosure sheet after that? The, the agent would have to disclose, yes. The agent discloses yeah. that. Okay. Well, the agent has to. So remember, it's, it's best practice for the seller to be the one to disclose it, but either way, the agent has to disclose it okay. because the agent has actual knowledge. Okay. All right, leased items or service contracts. This is where you would find out if they already have a home warranty that's gonna convey, if they have um, propane 
um, that so for the property, then the propane tanks in a lot of cases are leased from the company that uh, provides the propane. And so they, they get a discount, right, for the um, fuel that's put in. And so you need to know who owns the, the propane tank that's in the yard, um, anything like that, um, alarm system, you know, that this is where you're going to find out from the solar client. Um, yeah, solar panels. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Home warranty. Is your seller going to offer a home warranty? We talk a lot about home warranties lately, and home warranties are awesome for buyers to put seller coverage on, even if the seller is not offering the home warranty. The buyer, as soon as they ratify, can, you can order the home warranty with seller coverage so that you are covered prior to closing so that the pre-existing condition issue is mitigated right? So if it's two days after closing and something breaks, you've already had coverage on the property, okay? There is no risk for the uh, sellers to have coverage if the buyer doesn't ask for it in the contract. So you put seller coverage on, seller doesn't pay for it if the buyer doesn't take the warranty. So even if the buyer, even if the seller uses it, even if the seller has something break and uses it during the seller coverage period, the seller doesn't pay for the warranty. They pay their deductible, but they don't pay for the cost of the warranty. So to me, it's a no brainer, right? It would just be in my checklist, right? For every listing that I have, as soon as I get the listing agreement signed, order a home warranty, right? It, there's no downside to that. So there is really no cost to the seller? The cost to the seller is only if the buyer gets coverage for after closing. If the buyer does not request the home warranty, then the seller does not have to pay for anything. And I feel bad because we had a home warranty class last week and only two people showed up for the class. You were mine? <laughs> Thank you, Gailey. <laughs> All right, you yes, Mary. Uh, you said in the leased items, uh, home warranty. So the home warranty is conveyed to the buyers is the home warranty company will allow the old warranty to be conveyed to the uh, new buyers? Yes, sometimes, sometimes you have sellers that have uh, maintained a warranty on their property for years. And so they may have just renewed it, you know, two months before they put the home on the market. And yes, they can, they can transfer, the, you know, for the last, you know, seven, eight, nine months to the buyer. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Utilities and major systems. This is where you're going to verify with your seller. Um, how does their water get heated? Is it gas, electric? Is it the oil or propane? How about their air conditioning? Uh, do they have a heat pump? Same for the heating with the water supply. Are they on public water, private well? Do they have a septic system? Um, this is where you get the information about their utilities. Okay, broker duties. Broker shall perform and seller hereby authorizes broker to perform the following duties and exercise ordinary care to comply with the laws. We're gonna promote the best interest of the seller to provide services consistent with standards of practice um, for the licensee to be engaged in. And we're gonna follow regulations set up by the MLS, the Code of Ethics, the Code of Virginia, and regional rules and regulations of our lockbox system. Okay, this means we're not giving out codes to lockboxes so that clients can go in themselves. We're not going to start advertising things before we put them in the MLS because that's gonna get us a big fat $5,000 fine. Um, we're, we're going to comply with the rules and regulations that we are bound to regardless of what our client tells us to do. Um, the broker will use reasonable efforts to find buyers for the property at the price and terms set forth in the agreement. We will market the property at the broker's discretion, including 
um, having a description, having interior and exterior photos appro uh, when appropriate with the advertising media, such as publications, mailings, brochures, internet sites. Um, the broker will not be obligated to continue to market the property after the seller has accepted an offer. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that once you ratify a contract, you go from active to pending in the MLS. If, if you go active to active under contract, you're still marketing the property and you have to have additional um, approval from your seller to continue to market the property because you have to allow showings. Broker will present written offers and counter offers to seller in a timely manner, even if you have already ratified, okay? So even when offers come in after ratification, they still have to be presented unless you have something in writing from your seller that says, do not present the offers to me, Shannon. okay? I'm gonna say, present them anyway, even if you have something in writing, right? That says, I don't wanna see any more offers. I still think you need to give a courtesy to your sellers and say, hey, we got another offer in. Do you wanna see it? I know you told me you don't want to, but do you wanna know what it is? If uh, the uh, property is under contract, you say it can still be active and marketed? There's a status called active under contract, yeah, which is what's used to solicit backup offers. And it means the home still has to be shown and it's still available in the MLS. It's not active, it's called active under contract. So it means that there is a contract on the home already and backup offers are welcome. Shannon, could I ask a, a follow-up question to that? Yes. Um, as a listing agent, if you're going to put it active under contract and keep showing it, um, and you have a ratified contract on that. Is it a courtesy to tell the buyer agent that you're doing that or is it not really necessary? Or is it, or is it, you know, absolutely you should be doing that. So it's not, it's not necessary and it's not even a required courtesy. It, this is an education thing for the rest of our um, subscribers to the MLS and members of um, our associations because the next item on this says broker shall not continue to market show or permit showings after property is subject to ratify contract unless otherwise instructed by the seller in writing. So every listing that shows is active under contract at some point be able to feel confident that the seller has directed to solicit backup offers, right? And so if I'm a buyer agent and I see that it's active under contract, I might call the listing agent and say, hey, um, are you guys looking for backup offers or did you just put it in the wrong status by mistake, right? Um, I mean, you can tell them, look, my seller, you know, cause it's vacant, we're just gonna leave it active under contract, you know, just in case you never know what happens, but you know, we know you're solid, whatever. Um, so that's up to you, but there's no, there's no obligation to say anything. Um, I will say in most cases, agents are using the status incorrectly. They're using it like it's contingent on, you know, financing, home inspection, whatever, instead of putting it in the correct status of pending. And that's what I recently came across being on the buyer agent side um, she put it active under contract. And I said, are you still showing the home then? Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, oh, yes, we are. And I was like, oh, so you're taking backup offers? She's like, uh, yeah, until all of your contingencies are gone. So, uh, you know. Right. So. Which they can. And Which is fine. If that's yeah. what they're doing, I just, I, I wanted to make sure it was in the right column, not pin, you know, like you right. say. Yeah, so. exactly. Which you can check. Um, who did I miss in here? Christina or Gailey? So just to clarify, once it goes into pending, you are not still accepting backup offers, right? Pending, I, when I see pending, that to me says we're done. Yeah. Is that correct? So, so the question is once it's in pending, you're not accepting backup offers. So you as a seller are always 
allowed to accept backup offers, right? Any offer that comes in, even when it's pending, can be accepted as a backup offer. What it means is that you're not actively soliciting backup offers and you're not allowing showings. So Shannon, what if the backup offer is higher than what the uh, under contract offer is? Then the seller probably wants to ratify it as a backup offer so that if the first buyer walks away, they have a good offer to take. Okay, so they cannot just accept the second one and then let the first buyer know that they are not contract. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, G says, um, oh, F is about the earnest money deposits, but remember, we're not taking earnest money deposits. Don't touch someone else's money. That's the rule of thumb here. Broker shall, sh okay, this one's important. <clears throat> Broker shall show property during reasonable hours to prospective buyers and shall accompany or accommodate as needed other real estate licensees, their prospective buyers, inspectors, appraisers, exterminators, and other parties necessary for showings and inspections of property to facilitate and or consummate the sale of property. Okay, so if any of you are members of certain Facebook forums, you will see that agents complain a lot when they get a call from another agent or from a prospective buyer of another agent that says, can you show me 123 Main Street, my agent's out of town, okay? And the listing agent flips their lid and loses their mind and is like, why should I have to show somebody else's client because they're out of town, blah, 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 right? Or the agent calls from, let's say they call from Virginia Beach and they say, I have a client interested in 123 Main Street in Alexandria and I don't have Central Lock access. Can you let my client in to see the property because I don't have lockbox access? What, are you kidding? Why are you working with a client outside? Okay, right, besides the whole ethics thing. We have agreed as listing agents to do what it takes to help sell the property, right? So we don't get to have a hissy fit about the other agent not doing what they were supposed to because that's not in the best interests of our client, right? Now, when agent who's on vacation comes back and we find out that they are in a little boutique um, agency that doesn't have very many agents and wouldn't have had anybody to help them anyway, well, we reach out to them and we put them in touch with Sheila or Drew or Summer or me. And we talk to them about the benefits of being in a brokerage where we have all of these fabulous people that can support them, right? And we did what was right for our seller and we arranged for the show, okay? So not everybody is fortunate as us to have such a great group that will support us, right? you are never gonna call a listing agent and say, hey, can you show my client, right? That just wouldn't, it just wouldn't cross anybody's mind here. But not everybody's as fortunate, right? So give them the grace and remember what your listing agreement says. Okay. Broker agrees that the showing instructions to be shared in the MLS with other real estate licensees and their prospective buyers is blank, okay. This is super important to set the expectations with your clients in this conversation right here about how showings are gonna go. Do they have pets? Do you need 24 hour notice? Do you need two hour notice, four hour notice? Are you gonna use showing time? Are you gonna have every agent call you and make you wanna go insane because they're gonna call you to schedule the appointments and then you have to call your client. And then you have to call the agent back to confirm like you're gonna lose your marbles. Just use showing time. And you're going to have the conversation here about whether there's going to be the lockbox, right? Yes, of course, there's going to be a lockbox. It's going to be an electronic lockbox from Central Lock so that you can track who's going in and out, right? You're not going to use a combo box because I will beat you all. And I know this is being recorded. 
<laughs> but combo boxes are not safe. Don't use a combo box for showings, okay? If it's, if it's a, a contractor, right? You can use a combo box for contractors to go in, but not for showings. At this time and many other times, right? Because the time that you sign the listing agreement and the time that you go on the market, there's going to be space in between, right? You're going to have the conversation with your client that agents suck and they won't show up on time. They will try to schedule shorter than the window that you've put in for the showing instructions. They might just not show at all. And if you price it right and, sh and it shows well, you're going to minimize the time that they are on the market and have to deal with anyone besides you because they picked you because you are so wonderful. They're not gonna have to deal with anybody else. Okay, so just set their expectations. All right, multiple times because it's very hard. You cannot control other people. Shannon? Yes, Mary. NPR now allow us to take only one sentry lock. So I have two listings. I had to put one lock box on the other listing. Okay, come to my office and I will give you a lock box that you can use. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right, um, it's 1022. I was gonna give you guys a little break before. Let me just give you a quick five minute break in case anybody needs a bathroom or a refill on coffee or water. And then we will jump back in. Can I ask a question real quick? Of course, Allie. <laughs> it's about submitting offers to your sellers. If the offer isn't complete, meaning you find a missing initial on page eight, do you have to present that to your seller or can you turn it back around to the buyer's agent and say, this is an incomplete offer, kindly complete your offer and I would be happy to present it. So if it's just one missing initial, I would let the agent know and still present it because you can send it back as a counter offer for the initial if your client really wants to uh, move forward with it. If it's truly an incomplete offer, like they've only sent pages one through 13 and no addenda, you know, no depor, no lead paint, right? Like whatever else says it's attached, right? On page 12, then it's not really an offer. And so I would send it back to the buyer's agent and say, hey, I need the complete offer so that I can present this. And then I would still tell my seller, hey, I got an incomplete offer. There's nothing we can do with it because it doesn't include everything that it says it includes. Um, and I've gone back to the buyer's agent to try to get the whole thing for you. But there isn't anything you can do with an offer that truly is incomplete. Yeah. If it's missing some initials, um, then I still would submit it. I'd still okay. present it. Okay. Shannon, can I ask a question? Sure. Hi, Messina. Okay. Uh, if the, the, actually the buyer call you to show them the house because their agent is uh, not available, how will you handle it? First, you call the agent or? Yes. Okay. Yes, I always call the agent. If the agent is the not agent to know. If the agent is not responsive, what how what do you do from that on? Um, then I I will show the property and I will ask more questions like um, have they signed a buyer agency agreement? Yeah. Just, be, just because they have an agent doesn't mean they really have an agent, right? Yes. So I'll still meet them at the property. Okay. And okay. I'll dig a little deeper on what their relationship is with their agent. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. And then are you are you showing the property for someone with no pre-approval? Even he said, oh, I'm working on it and I will get it soon. Um, if they say that they're with another agent? No, 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 no. Oh. It's a buyer oh. from Zello, from Redfin. Oh, he saw no, my not listing. a chance. Mm. Not a chance. Mm -hmm. I will I, I will never take a buyer out to see properties that is not pre-approved. That mm -hmm. is a waste of my time and the seller's time uh, to let people into the home. I am never taking them out if they are not pre-approved. Thank you. And I want to speak to the lender personally. I'm not mm -hmm. just taking their garbage in, garbage out, you know, 
letter that they print from Rocket Mortgage. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. Thank and Rocket you. Mortgage is probably fine, but I know that you can go online and act and just put in information and it spits out a, a pre-qualification letter. Yeah. Where you don't have to talk to somebody. So I want to make sure that I have spoken to someone who's actually looked at documents and they are truly pre for them. Yeah, thank you. And then I know you're uh, on a break, but uh, uh, I just submit an offer. It is owned by LLC. And the listing agent is just those flat fee agent, you know, just uh, to place it. We still use their information on the contract, right? So it, it, the listing is owned by who? Um, at the, those flat fee uh, uh, brokerage, oh, you know, it's an, it's an MLS placement service. You mean? Yes, yes, yes. You still, yes, you still use their information as the listing company. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> All right. It is ten twenty-seven. So I want to go ahead and get into our material. Um, and actually, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the rest of this and I'll, we'll look at the tax record tomorrow. I don't think we're gonna have a lot of time to get into the tax record, so we'll do that tomorrow. Um, Cause tomorrow's our, our day to talk about rentals. And um, we have listing agreements to look at tomorrow for rentals as well. So it, it'll fit in tomorrow um, into that. All right, friends, we're gonna get started. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we are on the marketing MLS internet advertising. So another piece of a contract that we have to have to be valid is the on the market date. So this talks about um, how we're gonna market it, whether it's gonna be coming soon, whether it's not gonna be coming soon, if it's gonna be in the MLS, whether it's gonna feed out to public sites, all kinds of different things um, it talks about in this next section. So the first box says that the seller authorizes or does not authorize to go into the MLS, right? In almost all cases, your seller is going to say, yes, I wanted to go in the MLS. If the seller authorizes the property to go in the MLS, we have to have a date that it's going to go active in the MLS. So that's what this first section is about. When is it going to go active? So it's either going to go active three days from the date that this agreement is signed, or it's gonna go on some date in the future. Now back to our discussion earlier, when we were like, okay, get this agreement signed as soon as you can, even if they don't wanna sell till the spring, right? TBD doesn't work here. Put a date sometime in the future, whatever their target date is, and then you do an amendment if you have to change the date. When you have a target date for your sellers, they tend to work better towards that date, okay? It works, um, it works for both of you, the sellers and yourself. If the seller does not authorize you to put it in the MLS, um, this can be either an office exclusive or um, you would have to have the waiver of the MLS signed. If you have a situation where it's not going to the MLS, just come see me and I'll make sure that we have the appropriate paperwork signed mm -hmm. or right. And this has to do with active, not right. This section is the active. I'm good. Section. I'm good. Um, actually, I was. Miss Ina, can you mute? Thank you. All right. Um, the next section is whether or not the seller authorizes 
um, to the third party websites. So if there is anything that's marked no on here as far as the third party websites or this next section where uh, the display of property address or unedited comments or um, the automated estimate, right? The Zestimate, right, from Zillow. Um, there's a section when you put the listing in to Bright where you can actually mark no to these things, right? So then it won't feed out. And we don't have any control over what how accurate it is once you mark no because it's Bright that handles that. Um, but just be, pay attention if you have a client that marks no on any of it and have a conversation with them about the consequences, right? If they don't have their property address feed out, right? Then how will anyone know where the property is if for them to buy, right? Location, location, location. The next Shannon, section, yes, Amy. Um, just what you were saying before about if they request for something not to be in the MLS to come talk to you, uh, does that hold true for leases as well? It does, it does. Rentals are under the same rules as sales. All right, so section D is for the coming soon status. So this is whether or not the property is gonna go in coming soon status. So if the property is going in coming soon status, it can sit in coming soon status for 21 days, it will automatically flip to active. So just know that if you're going to use a coming soon status, it will automatically flip to active. It can never go back to coming soon status. It would have to go to temp off if your client's not ready to be active after that 21 days, it would have to go temp off. Incoming soon status, the home cannot be shown by anybody. You cannot show someone, you cannot take one of your colleagues to preview it. It cannot be shown by anyone. You can accept sight unseen offers. Uh, it just cannot be shown. So did you say you can accept the offer for the coming soon? Yes, you can accept sight unseen offers. Okay, so someone who has not seen the property yet can send you an offer. Shannon? Yes. What if our sellers let someone in? Like somebody was driving by and they, I mean, you told them no, but they let, they let a buyer in. Yeah, you don't have any control over that. Okay. Yeah. And the seller still can accept the offer then? Sellers can accept offers anytime. So before it goes in coming soon, while it's in coming soon, anytime an offer is, is presented it, to you, you have to present it to your seller and they can accept it. Shannon, I had a client ask me once, we didn't end up doing it, but there was a property they were interested in potentially making an offer in that was in coming soon status and it didn't have a video or you know a Matterport walkthrough. And they asked if it was possible to have just the, the owner take a video and share the video with them. Is that something that is permitted if it's still incoming soon, if it's not posted to the MLS? So all types of public marketing are allowed when it's incoming soon status. So anything that the listing agent wants to obtain and provide is allowed. Okay, even if that's just to my client and not to the whole MLS. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Christina and then Julie. So in the coming soon status, just on the point of marketing, because um, a lot of times you see in the coming soon status, there's not pictures, but you can actually post pictures and videos of the property while it's in coming soon status. Can you just clarify the marketing? Yes, okay. all marketing can happen. Okay. And I suggest while it's in coming soon status that you have your photos done or at least a good portion of them done because it's it's going to be sent to potential buyers, right, by agents. They're gonna see it in coming soon status. So you want, if you're putting it in coming soon status, then yeah. have it ready for, they just might not be ready for showings. They might've gotten ready enough for photos, but they just, they might not be ready for showings yet. Um, so have it as ready as possible. But every piece of marketing to your heart's desire can happen in coming soon status. You just can't show it. So that, the benefit of coming soon status is that you can start marketing. You just can't show it. Julie. 
a huge portion when it's a hot market, I don't know if it still is, but a huge portion of the homes in Falls Church City sell, the coming soon sign goes up and the next day the house is off the market, it's mm -hmm. already sold. Mm -hmm. So what is happening? Um, sight unseen offers. There are a lot of um, agents that market within certain areas and they know they know other agents that sell in that specific location and so they reach out and say hey i've got this new listing do you have a buyer um there's a lot of a lot of that that happens so the questions about you know if it goes in coming soon status and sells the next day how is that happening so often um and in a market like this where inventory is low that is what happens um, so is the agent allowed to vouch if, if uh, has our agents allowed to see the house when it's in no. no. So if, if I trust the listing agent and they say to me, it's a good house, then I can share that with my well, the, so the listing agent's always going to say it's a good house. They're trying to sell the house, right? So it's, it's about your buyers. Um, willingness to put an offer in and usually it's um you know contingent on a home inspection so they can get in during the home inspection and they can see the home and, um and if you accept an offer if your client accepts an offer when it's incoming soon status and it's sight unseen my advice is in the listing in the agent remarks but a comment that says offer received sight unseen in the contract somewhere, put offer accepted sight unseen, just so you have a paper trail that shows that it wasn't shown. Um, this next section is on dual and designated representation. We went over that yesterday. I will not go over it again, other than to remind you, yes to designated, no to dual. Section 12 is on compensation. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple minutes on compensation. So this is different from yesterday's compensation, right? This is not as scary as the buyer agent compensation paragraph. What this says is that the seller is going to pay a total commission of blank to KW United for your services. And if there is a buyer's agent that comes in, then you will share some of your commission with that buyer's agent. If there is no buyer's agent, you don't have to share your commission unless you mark something at the bottom that we'll get to. But in general, the basic principle of this listing agreement is the total commission on line one comes to KW United. And if there is a buyer's agent, the cooperating broker, right, listed in section B, then you will be so kind as to share some of your commission with that agent who brought the buyer, okay? If you're going in the MLS, you have to have commission listed, right? We talked about that yesterday. There has to be co-broker compensation listed. So where that number comes from is 12B. It does not have to be split 50-50. It can be split any way you choose with your seller's consent, as long as you're consistent, okay? Variable rate commission means that there could be a situation when a buyer comes in that doesn't have an agent or uses the listing agent or a member of their team as their agent and the commission gets reduced, okay? So the commission then is variable. It changes based on the circumstance, okay? That's what variable rate commission means. There is a circumstance where that commission can change. Variable rate commission has to be disclosed in the listing. It, you don't have to say what the commission changes to. You just have to say that yes, we have in our listing agreement that there is a circumstance where variable rate commission can apply. Why do we have to disclose that? Well, if you have two offers that come in for your seller at $500,000 and the commission on offer A is going to have to pay out 
$25,000 because they have an agent that they brought with them, right? Buyer has an agent that they brought with them. So commission's $25,000. The net to the seller is $475,000. Okay, everybody with me? Okay. Offer B comes in at $500,000. But we have variable rate commission because that buyer did not bring an agent with them. So the commission has been reduced to $10,000. So now the net to the seller is only or it has increased to $490,000. So the sale price is still the same at 500, but their costs because the commission changed based on the situation. Now, the amount the seller will receive is higher if they take the offer from the buyer who did not bring an agent. Okay, does everybody follow that? Okay, I'm gonna go over it again because I got some no's and that's okay. Two offers come in that are equal, $500,000, okay? Offer one brought, it, brought an agent. So they have to pay the full commission. The seller has to pay the full commission of $25,000, okay? So now their net is 475, okay? Because of their expense. Offer B comes in and didn't have an agent. And because me as the listing agent said, if a buyer comes in and doesn't have an agent, I will reduce my commission. So you don't have to pay the buyer agent portion. I'm gonna reduce my commission. So you only have to pay 10,000, right? So now the net to the seller is 490, okay? So it's better for the seller to take the offer for the age, one that didn't have an agent, okay? Even though the offer prices were the same, closing dates were the same, right? All other things equal, the buyer that had an agent would now have to offer more money in order to be competitive with the buyer that didn't have an agent, all right? So that's why variable rate commission has to be disclosed in the listing because you have to know what, you're, what you could be competing against, okay? If there are multiple offers on a property, the listing agent, should be disclosing whether any of those offers qualify on that variable rate, right? So whether they're from themselves or from someone in the office. Okay. So what? You would write whatever the situation is that qualifies for the variable rate. Right, if that's what you're gonna do. Now, you don't have to, right? If you're, like for me, I don't want buyers to be unrepresented. So I'm not gonna write that. I'm not gonna have variable rate commission. I'm going to do everything that I can if an unrepresented buyer comes in to have them get an agent, right? Um, because it truly is better for my seller for that buyer to be represented. It's not all about the bottom line, right? Um, so yes, because you would, you or put NA, right? Now, when it comes to what you put in compensation, you're going to have a little more homework. I'm going to give you more than overnight to think about this, okay? I'm going to give you till next Monday to think about this. You need to decide what services you're going to provide and for what fee you're going to provide those services, okay? My suggestion will be to start with your basic package. Okay, this is what my basic package is going to be. And it's whatever you want it to be. So it's going to be professional photos, staging, one open house a weekend, professional flyers, social media, blah, 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 whatever you want it to be. Okay, if you need help figuring out what that is, you can reach out to your coach, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to your team leader, we will help you go through this, okay? You can reach out to an ALC member, you, you have people that you can run this through with, okay? That is going to be your base package, and that's going to be your base fee. Then you come up, let's just call it the, uh, the gold package, okay? Then you come up with enhanced services that you can provide 
for an increased fee. That can be your platinum package. Okay, so maybe two open houses a weekend and paid Facebook advertising and whatever, right? So increased services for an increased fee. And then when you meet someone who wants to haggle you on your price, then you have your discounted services where you get one open house a month and you get black and white brochures or whatever, right? Like you get your discounted services for your discounted price. And this goes back to our little bit of a discussion yesterday about not charging different people different fees for the same services. And so when you have this thought out and laid out already about what your fees are, what services you provide, it's going to be much easier when you go into a listing appointment and you have this laid out. Also, there's a little bit of psychology that goes into that, right? When you lay out three different prices, what are people usually going to pick? The middle. That, yeah, they a lot of the time they pick the middle, which is your basic package anyway, right? So think about that. So could you do five, five and a half and six? Could you do five, six and seven? Could you, whatever you wanna do, you pick, right? You're not gonna go below four and a half, right? Because we're not a discount brokerage. So four and a half is, would be your lowest that you could go. And you're worth every penny that you charge. So when you remember that, you will get that, okay? You are worth every penny. So don't discount yourself. So then you decide what amount you're going to be offering in buyer agency compensation, right? Think about how you feel when you see a ridiculous number in buyer agency compensation. Okay, think about that. How is the psychology when you see an agent that works with their sellers to discount the buyer agency compensation? How does that feel? Okay, have those conversations with your seller. If you want to discount your side, my suggestion is leave buyer agency compensation always the same across the board, no matter what, okay? Unless you have a seller that says, I want to pay more, take it. But pick a number, if it's gonna be three, then always leave it at three. No matter what your number is, right? Your total number, you get whatever's left after you put three or two and a half or two. Yes, I did not, um, change my facial expression there on purpose, right? Um, just think about that, okay? You don't wanna ever do a disservice to your seller when you're marketing the home. And there are buyers agreements that have high numbers on there that buyers are required to pay their agents. So remember that too. The buyer might decide not to come to see the house. Okay, retainer fees and early termination. Retainer fee, of course, is that check that you collect up front. Maybe you do a retainer fee on your 7%, 8% listing, whatever, because you're doing all these extra services that require upfront costs, right? So you take a retainer fee on that. Most agents, I'm not seeing retainer fees, early termination fees on listings. I do believe in. I personally had early termination where I put the words actual costs on my listing agreement. And this, I would provide receipts. I didn't early terminate very often, but the couple of times that I did, I wanted back for photos and things um, that I spent. Um, so you can put any number that you want there, um, or you can put the words actual costs. Yes, Gailey. So, you know, we had a situation where we had to terminate one of these. We put actual costs and we ended up waiting not asking the correct cost. Part of our thinking was we weren't sure if, because we're terminating the agreement or is it just 
they like the capital okay. cost only kicks in if they terminate the agreement. We were terminating it. Okay, so that's a great that's a great comment. So Gailey said, when do the um when does that early termination fee apply? If we're terminating it or if they're terminating it? Well, we do not have the option to terminate a listing agreement. So you it, well, the buy the seller has to has to terminate. Now, generally, there's a meeting of the minds that the agreement is being terminated, but we cannot unilaterally send a notice to terminate a listing agreement. Even if we cannot stand our sellers anymore, we can't terminate a listing agreement. Um, the buy on a buyer agency agreement, either party can serve notice, so we can set buyers free and say goodbye, have a nice life. Um, but on a listing agreement, only the seller can. So if there is a situation where you need to cut a seller loose, that's when I get to get involved and hang out with you and work it out. <laughs> So she's really good at it too. <laughs> so this is this is when we joke about how sometimes my mommy voice comes out at times that you guys don't like my mommy voice. And then other times you guys are really thankful that I have a mommy voice. Um, and I usually can work it out for you guys where you get what you need. Um, and even if the sellers are awful people, you should still get your costs. I've had, I had one seller who, a couple, they were awful people. They were horrible people. And I got my money before we executed the release. Listing amendment. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I'm gonna go through just one or two more things. Um, and then we're gonna switch gears to team rallies and we'll finish everything else up tomorrow. Um, confidential information, same thing we talked about yesterday on confidential information. Don't tell the other side things that you don't have permission from your seller to tell them. So why they're moving, um, you know, that they're motivated sellers. You see this all the time, motivated sellers. Oh my goodness. Can I just tell you how many of these motivated sellers don't realize that they're motivated sellers, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, so just be careful with what you share. Um, you know, don't be that agent that talks a lot, you know, on the buyer side, we like the agents that talk a lot, but don't be that agent when the buyer's agent calls you. Authorization to disclose other offers. This is when agents call and say, is there another offer on the property? You're not giving specifics. You're not saying, yes, there's an offer that came in. It was a $500,000 and they want to close on the 22nd of the month. And blah, 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 blah. It's just, do I have offers? Yes or no, right? So um, I say it's always good to say that you have offers because then you can call for highest and best. You can have people, you know, put forth their best effort and it saves a lot of headache. What about the number of offers if they ask us? Sure. As long okay. as, as long as they mark yes. Mm -hmm. Compliance with fair, fair housing laws, same paragraph as yesterday. Relocation programs, same paragraph as yesterday. HOA and condo associations, these are liens on the property. So we need to know whether they're in an HOA or a condo or both. And we need to fill this out appropriately. There is an option for the seller to order the HOA resale package or you as the agent to order the resale package. Please don't have your seller order the resale package. You should order the resale package and order it immediately when you sign this listing agreement. Do not ever check the box that says within three days following date of ratification. You want to have this package in your hot little hand so that when the ratified contract is delivered, the next email is here is your resale package. <laughs> it would be at the time of listing. You want that three days to start on the date of ratification, not mm -hmm. three days from whenever the HOA decides to send you this package. The other benefit to that is that if there are violations, which there are almost always violations because our HOAs have um, this little complex where they like to um, you know, have some authority over something. And so they come and say that you need to power wash or you have weeds in your lawn or whatever it is that they wanna say you have that well in advance so that your seller can take care of what they need to take care of and you get your care letter, okay? So that's it.
you guys are done for the day. If you are a Falls Church agent, you guys come on in. If you're a Falls Church agent, you're gonna switch over to the help desk link for our team rally. Everybody's welcome. If you are a Fredericksburg agent, you are going to go to the office for your team rally that starts at noon. And if you are a Kingstown agent, you get the rest of the day to work and reach out to your clients. And I will see all of you lovelies at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you all Thanks, so Anna. much for Anna. being here. Thank you. Thank see you, Anna. Tomorrow. Oh, we don't have to do this. Yeah, you don't. I see you.